In this presentation, we will take a look at some items of Scripture and blocks of Scripture from John chapter 14 through chapter 17. Again, I'd encourage you to read those chapters before listening so you'll know the details. I won't necessarily go through the details of the passages and so that you'll be familiar with them. Let's begin with John chapter 14, verses 6 through 13, where Jesus declares that he is the way, the truth, and the life, and that if we are going to come to know the Father, that we must focus on him. This is his discourse where he tells Philip, when the Philip asks him, show us the Father, he says, well, if you have, if you have seen me and you know who I truly am, then you have seen the Father. So much are they one in unity in what they do. And so our focus must be on the Savior. That is what we focus on. The rituals, the commandments, the ordinances, the things we do are all important, but the focus has to be on the Savior. Our desires and focus must be on the Savior if we are to become like Him. If we focus on the Savior and His teachings, then we will we be focused on the Father also. Elder Uchtdorf of the Quorum of the Twelve said, Is it wrong to have rules? Of course not. We all need them every day. But it is wrong to focus on the rules instead of focusing on the Savior. See, we could get so caught up in the rules and the prohibitions and the performances of the gospel that we forget to focus on him. But if we will focus on the Savior and come to know him, then we will automatically want to keep the rules, the commandments, the ordinances of the gospel. If we focus on the Savior and come unto him, then we will come to know the Father and will have the desire to keep his commandments, his rules. However, if we are not careful, we could focus just on rules and never come to know the Savior. And so that's a good thing to contemplate and to ponder in our lives. Where is my focus? Is it on him? And my desire to become like him and to do as he would do, to think as he would think. Where is my focus in life? John chapter 14, verses 15, 21, 23, and 31 teach us something important. Notice what is similar in all of these. And the repetition, whenever Christ repeats things, then that is a sign of we should pay attention. Notice what he says about loving him. If we truly love him, it's easy to say that we love him. But he's going to give us a clear indication on how we can tell if we truly love him or not. Verse 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. So there is a sign of our love. How well we keep the commandments will be determined by how well we love him. That's a sign of our love for him. Verse 21, He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. So again, we see this connection between keeping God's commandments and our love for him. 23. Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and he will come unto him, and we will make our abode with him. So again, Truly loving the Savior will be manifested in how well we keep his words, his commandments, his sayings, his teachings. Verse 31, but that, ye, 
but that the world may know that I love the Father, and as the Father gave me commandments, even so I do. Arise, let us go hence. How did the Savior show the love for his Father? By keeping the commandments that his Father had given him to do. It appears that our love of the Savior will be in direct proportion to our desire to keep his commandments. We are only fooling ourselves if we think we love the Savior, but lack the desire and the keeping of his commandments the best we can. There are many who no longer participate in Christ's church, who have left attending church or living the gospel, but they will declare that, well, I still love the Savior, even though I'm no longer a part of his gospel or a part of his church. And that is a deception of Satan. These verses clearly point out that if we truly love him, then we will keep his commandments and all the things that he has asked us to do. John chapter 15, verses 1 through 12, the famous verses about Christ comparing him and us to a vine and the branches. Just as the branches cannot survive without the vine, we cannot survive without Christ. He must abide in us and we must abide in him. Elder David A. Bednar gave the following insights about what it means to abide in Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ extends to each of us the invitation to abide in him. But how do we actually learn and come to abide in him? The word abide denotes remaining fixed or stable and endure without yielding. Elder Jeffrey R. Holland explained that abiding as an action means to stay, but to stay forever. Do we stay with Christ? No matter what comes up, our afflictions, controversies, different things that may come up in the church, are we willing to stay with him forever, regardless of the frailties of man? Back to Elder Bednar. That is the call of the gospel message to everyone in the world. Come, but come to remain. Come with conviction and endurance. Come permanently for the sake and for the sake of all the generations who must follow you. Thus we abide in Christ as we are firm and steadfast in our devotion to the Redeemer and as holy purposes in times both good and bad. We begin to abide in the Lord by exercising our moral agency to take upon ourselves his yoke through the covenants and ordinances of the restored gospel. The covenant connection we have with our Heavenly Father and his resurrected and living Son is the supernal source of perspective, hope, power, peace, and enduring joy. It also is the rock-solid foundation upon which we should build our lives. We abide in him by striving continually to strengthen our individual covenant bond with the Father and the Son. For example, praying sincerely to the Father in the name of his beloved Son deepens and fortifies our covenant connection with them. We abide in him by truly feasting upon the words of Christ. The Savior's doctrine draws us as children to the covenant, closer to him, and will tell us all things that we should do. We abide in him by preparing earnestly to participate in the ordinance of the sacrament, reviewing and reflecting on our covenant promises, and repenting sincerely. Worthily partaking of the sacrament is a witness to God that we are willing to take upon ourselves the name of Christ and strive to always remember him after the brief period of time required to participate in that sacred ordinance. 
and we abide in him by serving God as we serve his children and minister to our brothers and sisters. The Savior said, If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. I briefly have described several of the many ways we can abide in the Savior. And now I invite each of us as his disciples to ask, seek, knock, and learn for ourselves by the power of the Holy Ghost other meaningful ways we can make Christ the center of our lives in all that we do. There again is that focus on Christ. Do we abide in him? Only if we abide in him will he abide in us. As John 15, 5 states, For without me ye can do nothing. Thus our need to center our lives upon the Savior. We should, he should be the focus of all we think, say, and do. So again, you see another pattern in these chapters in John of where our focus must lie in this life. Our focus must be on the Savior, and He must be the center and the purpose of everything that we do. John chapter 14, verses 16 and 26, and then chapter 16, verses 7 through 17, John lists six functions of the Holy Ghost. So here are six ways you can know that the Holy Ghost is functioning in your life. First, John 14, 16, he will be a comforter to abide with us. So receiving comfort comes from the Holy Ghost. If you feel those comfort, comfort feelings from him, then you, are know he, then you can know he is functioning in your life. Number two, John 14, 26, he will teach us all things. As Moroni 10.5 says, and by the power of the Holy Ghost, you may know the truth of all things. So as I am being taught and as I learn new gospel principles and as new teachings come to my mind, that is a function of the Holy Ghost. Then I know that's of him as I am learning new things in the gospel. Number three. John 16, 26, he will bring all things to your remembrance. Maybe you've had experiences where you recall certain things in certain situations of the gospel that he helps you and brings back to remembrance important principles that you must live in a timely manner. That's the Holy Ghost does that. We, we don't do that. That's not of ourselves as he brings things back to our remembrance. Chapter or number four, John sixteen seven through eleven, he will reprove, meaning scold or correct, the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. Of sin because they refuse to believe in and follow the true Messiah. So he will reprove the world because of their lack of following him. The Holy Ghost will reprove or correct the world of righteousness because they will be convicted because they will not follow in righteousness. So the righteousness of Christ and the Holy Ghost and the Godhead will convict those who refuse to follow them. Number three, and of judgment, the Holy Ghost will bring judgment, correct us through judgment, because Satan, whom they insist on following, will be judged and found wanting. Number five, John 16, 3, he will guide you in all truth, for he will speak for the Father and the Son. So as you learn new truths, that comes from the Holy Ghost. All truth comes from him. It does not come from us. Truth, as Doctrine Covenants section 19, or 93, verse 24 says, Truth is knowledge of things as they are, as they were, and as they will be. We do not know truth. Because in order to know truth, you have to know the past, present, future at once. 
only God and the Godhead and the Holy Ghost can declare truth unto us. Things that are, that were, and that will be. Verse 6, I mean number 6, John sixteen fourteen, He will glorify Christ, for he will receive of Christ and show it unto you. And so as we've been talking about focusing and centering on Christ, that will require the Holy Ghost. One of his jobs is to glorify him in our lives. And so the more you come to know Christ, it will be through the Holy Ghost and his power that he will reveal that. So those are six ways you can ponder and think on how the Holy Ghost functions and what his mission is here upon this earth. John 16, 33, be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Elder Rasband said, to be of good cheer is to trust him when things don't work as we planned. It means to soldier on when difficult tasks and twists in life take us in unexpected directions, when tragedy and hardship shatter our dreams. But the Lord reminds us, in this world your joy is not full. But in me, your joy is full. Trusting in God, I would say especially during the times when they're not going as we would want them to go, is to be of good cheer. President Nelson tells us what it means that I have overcome the world and how to overcome the world. He said, Dear brothers and sisters, my message to you today is that because Jesus Christ overcame this fallen world and because he atoned for each of us, you too can overcome this sin-saturated, self-centered, and often exhausting world. Because the Savior through his infinite atonement redeemed each of us from wickedness, mistakes, and sin, and because he experienced every pain worthy and burden you have ever had, worry, I'm sorry, worry and burden you have ever had, then as you truly repent and seek his help, you can rise above this present precarious world. You can overcome the spiritually and emotionally exhausting plagues of the world, including arrogance, pride, anger, immorality, hatred, greed, jealousy, and fear. Despite the distractions and distortions that swirl around us, you can find true rest, meaning relief and peace, even amid your most vexing problems. This important truth prompts three fundamental questions. One, first, what does it mean to overcome the world? Second, how do we do it? And third, how does overcome the world bless our lives? What does it mean to overcome the world? It means overcoming the temptation to care more about the things of the world than the things of God. It means trusting the doctrine of Christ more than the philosophies of men. It means delighting in truth, denouncing deception, and becoming humble followers of Christ. It means choosing to refrain from anything that drives the Spirit away. It means being willing to give away even our favorite sins. Now, overcoming the world certainly does not mean being perfect in this life, nor does it mean that your problems will magically evaporate, because they won't. And it does not mean that you won't still make mistakes. But overcoming the world does mean that your resistance to sin will increase. Your heart will soften as your faith in Christ increases. Overcoming the world means growing to love God and his beloved son more than you love anyone or anything else. How then do we overcome the world? King Benjamin taught us how. He said that the natural man is an enemy to God and remains so forever, unless he yields to the enticings of the Holy Spirit, and putteth off the natural man, and becometh a saint through the atonement of Christ the Lord. Each time you seek for and follow the promptings of the Spirit, each time you do anything good, things that the natural man would not do, you are overcoming the world. 
Overcoming the world is not an event that happens in a day or two. It happens over a lifetime as we repeatedly embrace the doctrine of Christ. We cultivate faith in Christ by repenting daily and keeping covenants that endow us with power. We stay on the covenant path and are blessed with spiritual strength and personal revelation, increasing faith and ministering of angels. Living the doctrine of Christ can produce the most powerful, virtuous cycle, creating spiritual momentum in our lives. And as we strive to live the higher laws of Jesus Christ, our hearts and our very natures begin to change. The Savior lifts us above the pull of this fallen world by blessing us with greater charity, humility, generosity, kindness, self-discipline, peace, and rest. Now, you may think this sounds more like hard spiritual work than rest, but here's the grand truth. While the world insists that power, possessions, popularity, and pleasures of the flesh bring happiness, they do not. They cannot. What they do produce is nothing but a hollow substitute for the blessed and happy state of those who keep the commandments of God. The truth is that it is much more exhausting to seek happiness where you can never find it. However, when you yoke yourself to Christ, Jesus Christ, and do the spiritual work required to overcome the world, he and he alone does have, have the power to lift you above the pull of this world. Now, how does overcoming the world bless our lives? The answer is clear. Entering into a covenant relationship with God binds us to him in a way that makes everything about life easier. Please do not misunderstand me. I did not say that making covenants makes life easy. In fact, expect opposition. Expect the advers because the adversary does not want you to discover the power of Jesus Christ. But yoking yourself with the Savior means you have access to his strength and redeeming power. Again, notice the focus. We must focus on the Savior and his teachings, his way, his truth, his life, if we are going to overcome the world. That is how he overcame the world, by focusing on the Father's teachings, Father's way, the Father's truth, and his life. John 17.3 and this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God in Jesus Christ, whom he has sent. To gain eternal life, we must come to know God and Jesus Christ. Elder Bruce R. McConkie said, If we are to know God, we must believe as he believes, think as he thinks, and experience what he experiences. How do we, only through scripture study and the Holy Ghost can we come to know what Christ believes. See the significance why we must participate in scripture study, whether that's the standard works or gospel talks, um, general conference talks. We must come to know what he believes and then believe as he does. We must have the Holy Ghost put into our minds thoughts as he thinks. And then we must experience the experiences he did. Both the positive and the negative, those that brought sorrow and affliction. For without those, without pain and suffering, we can never know true happiness and joy. So, come to believe as he believes. Try to think as he would think. Ask the Holy Ghost to help us with that. And then be willing to experience the experiences he went through. There is a great, great difference between knowing about God and knowing God. You can know all kinds of things about him and never come to know him. 
The only way to come to know God and Jesus Christ is to become one of them, to become like them, to become one with them. John 17, 20 says, Neither pray I for these, the apostles alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through there the apostles' word. There is a great teaching here. We will receive the words of Christ through his apostles. The way back to Christ will be through them. It will be through the apostles, the first presidency and the quorum of twelve, that we come unto Christ, meaning we cannot be at odds with them and come unto Christ. It must be through them. Now that does not make them infallible, but that does make them those who hold the keys to guide and direct this church and that we must sustain them too if we are to come unto Christ. Christ, as he said, and I pray for them that believe on me through their words, through the apostles' words, even if they make mistakes. John 17, verses 21 through 22 says that they all may be one as thou father art in me and i in thee that they also may be one in us that the world may believe that thou hast sent me and the glory which thou gavest me i have given them that they may be one even as we are one that is the way we come to know him to become one with them. Christ prayed for unity as we focus on Christ and focus on his thoughts, his ways, his teachings, what he would do to have the mind of Christ by the power of the Holy Ghost. That is how we will become one all together. It will only be through because we all seek to come unto Christ. It appears the Lord is more interested in unity than diversity. Christ wants to unite us. And the only way we will be united as a church, as a kingdom, is through Christ and coming unto him. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed the presentation, hit the like button and consider subscribing to the channel.